But uh, we are live. This is pretty cool. Pretty uh, there. Let's see if we can get anyone on. Still, still on the AO. Uh, I don't think anyone's here yet, but I'll just talk as if someone is. So, welcome. This is the uh, celebration of the level design lobby. Uh, and I want to celebrate it with everyone from the, the Discord, obviously. And it's great to be, I guess, like I said, just celebrating it with everyone. It's uh, it's pretty cool. We're still going live. Still waiting for people to come online. Still. There we are. Got people here. Thank you all for joining. So. I'm Max, I'm the host of the Level Design Lobby, and uh, thank you all for being here. As many of you do know, of those who do not, this is a celebration. It's a celebration of a benchmark for achieving the fourth goal on the Level Design Lobby, which is, uh, <laughs> you know, which is amazing. So I want to just do this as a, a thank you to all of you for... Uh, for supporting the Patreon, and I thought one of the best and more interesting ways to do it, I'll run around so I've got a bit more, a bit more work going on. Uh, <laughs> I've got the circle motion down. Uh, just to say thank you, and uh, I thought it'd be a really cool one for us to go through a game together and break it down. So without further ado, let's kind of get into this. So we've gone for Yakuza Zero. This will contain some mild spoilers for you because. I'm a little bit, a little bit into the game, not too far in, but I got some stuff. And we're currently doing a side mission, in which we start to see this organization, this real estate organization, has come through, and start to kick people out. So we need to find out, you know, who they are, and guess stop them from doing this. So we're going to go through the game and just break down some of the level design. So let's talk about some of the stuff already here. Now, if you can look at this and the mini-maps, there's a few things that you can see right away, right? Let's go to here to show up. It doesn't have very long straights. As you can see, this is very angled here. Now, the reason for this is for optimization. When it's doing something like this, it's stopping the level from overloading all the streaming and seeing things from, log from loading. We do have longer views over here, though. And another thing that it does, we can see, is this is the main street. So this is uh, the 80s in, uh, in Japan. And if we look here, we've got all this space. All this space to run around, do whatever we want. But if we go down a little side alley, do you see how the space has diminished here? And what that's using is the visual language to basically signify that we're on a... Uh, a, sorry, I wasn't trying to turn on the volume. Uh, yes, to turn on the volume. Oh, we've got some stuff going on here. So, uh, let's uh, have some fun. Now, one of the main the main kind of features, I guess, of the game is... Ooh. Let's break it down, boys. Ooh. Ba -ba -ba. Ooh. And there goes his liver. And he'd probably be dead. <laughs> okay, so we kind of got distracted here. 
Uh, I don't know if you guys want to read me to read the voices. Uh, I probably won't. So let's uh, let's go through there. Uh, so yeah, so as you can see with the side paths as well. Not only are they smaller, they're actually slightly contained as well. Now the feeling probably for this is what I can't obviously speak for them, but I believe the feeling for this is to basically have a different feeling to outs to the uh, to the other area. So we come back round and boom. You instantly feel on the main streets. Another way they show this is they actually the population that you have. So as you can see we've got a lot more people and a lot more I guess nicer looking people here, very friendly, compared to down in the side alleys as well. So again, they're using this as visual language to show to the players what's on the main path and what's onto the side path. Now, as you can see though, oh, we're about to get uh, into another fight. Let's do this. Right, let me just lay down the boot. Yeah. Switch stances. I'm going to talk about these stances a little bit later on. But as you can see, if we pick this up. Now. Uh, one of the, the reasons they... Uh, So one of the, the other things they do here, the reason why they have it this wide also is for the combat. As you can see there, the combat can happen at any moment and we can be surprised by these random events and these random encounters. And what's also very interesting is if you look around here, they populate things, not only just for environment art, but or for storytelling. But they do it because this can actually be used in combat as shown by that man taking a bicycle to the face. So. Let's keep moving on. Now, if you actually look about at this again, I want to point this out. Cities are a lot more gridded than what they are here. And what do I mean when I say that? So a city is divided normally into different grids. If you look at New York especially, that's one of the biggest prime examples of it. But there's a lot more bends in here, and that's... Primarily for optimization as well as making running feel smoother and nicer than running in a straight line. Um. Oh no. It's an invisible wall. Okay. This is one thing I'm personally not a fan of is when games kind of just have an invisible wall here. Now there is a main road, so they don't want you to run there, I get that. It doesn't like break anything, but it can be... When I'm getting chased, for example, like that there, I would find that difficult without knowing that there's a barrier there. So one of the things I would suggest is signpost the barriers. But, you know, one small thing. So, let's continue on with the mission at hand. Yo, you got word on any good jobs? I, I don't know if I'm going to do voices. I'm not great at voices. If I did, I'd be doing them myself. Speaking of, I hear Sakusan. I really hope I pronounced the names correctly here, guys. Just got back from the gig. It's about real estate. I'm not going to do voices. <laughs> you serious? Lucky bastard. You think he'd cut me in on some of that? I asked him. Who knows? Can't have to ask, I guess. He's probably over on Public Park 3 with his buddies. So now we have some information, obviously. <laughs> now, Yakuza is mainly just about fighting. It's got a very good story to it as well. This is the second Yakuza I've played. Uh, the first one was Yakuza 2 back on PS2 time. Uh, and this is the one I picked up because it was getting a lot of good responses. Oh. Another guy's getting his head kicked in. What I find interesting there is, if you think back to the original Assassin's Creed, you had to find yourself in a stealth position to be able to listen to conversations compared to stand here and listen. It's just interesting how they do things different. 
I'm more in favor of the gameplay, like in Assassins. But that's just my opinion there, guys. So, let's get on with it. Let's intervene. Okay. Let's kick some ass and take some names. Oh, that's nice. I don't know if you can hear that there, but if we switch stances again, can you hear the music change of this? Okay. Boom, boom. Oh. Alright, that's something I hadn't noticed, but that's very cool there in case you didn't see or well, hear that, sorry. So you can switch different stances for different fighting styles in the game. But what it did there nicely was not only did it change the uh, the different colour, the the aura around you from pink to blue to orange, but it also changed the music as well to reflect your fighting style. So the pink one is called Rush, where it's very much more... It's more about being fast. And it's got that kind of fast beat as well. Now when I switch to the orange one though, <coughs> which is, I believe is called Brawl, um, that had more of a slower beat because you're much slower but you've got more power to it. So I find that really nice that they've added a cool uh, audio element to it. So when having some changes like that, I also recommend doing something like that. I think that's a really nice, nice touch to it. Now, there is one thing I've played Yakuza for a little bit is it kind of lacks landmarks, you know, weenies. If you look here, that skyline is all very similar. Now it does have sort of these more micro landmarks, such as this here, because when you get through this, you'll know this is where you actually go to train to meet, uh, go over there to train. Uh, let's not fight today. Um, but there is also other kind of clubs that the player will remember. This as well, Dance Fever. Oh, they're gaining out. That's nice. So when you're sprinting there... Oh, sorry, let's finish off my original point. So yeah, as you can see, there's a lot going on. And obviously that's how Japan is. They've taken a lot of time to recreate these streets. But you can see how everything gets drowned out because of that. There's nothing drawing me in this way, or drawing me down. Well, this one actually frames quite well. I'll take that one back. This street frames that well, but it might have been framed better if you started to cut off some of these signs and have that there, and just have that, sorry, there. And what it could be done is you see these, one of the things it's doing really well is these moving lights. I apologize this is um, <laughs> not as action-packed for some of you as you may like to have been. But you see the moving lights, that also draws players' eyes in, as well as these being very different bright colored lights. But, like I said, there's not as big, kind of memorable landmarks compared to other cities that we've seen. So, let's carry on. Let's go have some fights. See, you hear that there? Oh, Ah. Fuck. Ah. Oh. See, what you guys don't realize is I'm pretty much a pro fighting this. I don't normally get damaged. I'm taking damage on purpose to help tell a better narrative. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> Let's talk about this crossing as well. Because normally, do you see how this is askew compared to what you'd normally have as a, you know, just a traditional kind of cross where everything... Is, uh, is straight, but we actually have this more jagged. 
And again, that's very interesting. And it's also used to way to pull people in. So you see how they're trying to encourage you. And it seems more like it's equal on both sides. I'd be interested to know what you think. Please write in the comments which ones you think, which side you draw to, left or right. And if you look on the right here, a couple of things they're trying to do. They have the green and orange. So there's a lot of different colors down here on the right. And if you look at this path here, do you see how that's angled? So that way that's angled to pull you in here. So it's not a 90 degree turn because it's bigger and opening up like a bigger mouth to pull the players around this corner here. So that's one of the ways that it's doing it with this as well. Now, if we look on the left though, what we've got pulling us over here is that view is way more open on the left. So you see how that kind of frame, if you will, with these two walls, the one on the left and the one on the right, it's got a nice frame and you can see further down there on the left hand side again drawing you in as well oh that's very interesting you see how this is angled a bit more like um i'm trying to think of the word for it i'm stumbling my words this has got more of a straight line to it well here has more of a curve round as well it's small details but again not exactly 90 because it's turning around here and this is cut 45 degrees compared to if the wall came all the way out here. So let me know which ones you think draws you in. But it's a very interesting way on how they bring the players down through here anyway. And we've got some stuff going on here. What should we see? Look at that. That's pretty cool. One of the things they're also trying to do, as you can see here, is it's got a very... The, the prop dressing and the artists have really spent a lot of time doing an environmental storytelling here. We can see that a lot of people kind of live here, as you can see with the bikes and stuff. And it's the back of the building with a lot of, you know, bin bags. We also have a shrine here, which, okay, let's see what's going on here. Uh, oh... Okay. Interesting. Huh. Okay, I didn't know what that was. But again, that's really cool because this is encouraging players to explore by having something that is so unique in its way. If you look at this building type, that's a very traditional, I believe it's a shrine. Uh, please someone correct me if I am wrong. Uh, a shrine here, which has that very traditional feeling compared to what's going on outside here there. Now we can go back out and try to explore, We're going the wrong way. Oh, looks like something's about to go down. Ah. Uh... To... If you look at this as well, this is really nice. With their street stories, they have this very upbeat, kind of funky guitar going along, showing how different these quests are, and you know instantly because of the music that this is not part of the main game. Well, the main story, should I say? <laughs> yeah. 
So it seems that they want me to stand there and look kind of badass, I guess. <laughs> I will say that their streets, these kind of uh, side quests, are definitely some of the more out there side quests I've, I've played. I'm putting on in a hurry. Well, this is going to draw at the end of the first 20 minutes. I am going to be coming over to Twitch uh, soon where you see my face um, and we can chat more and you can ask me questions. I do hope that you have enjoyed this kind of small segment. Oh, shit. That guy with the big arrow is going to mess me up. Do you want... Uh... Sorry, guys. I don't want to get my ass handed to me. So yeah, I just want to say thank you for checking this out. It's been a nice little thing. I hope you kind of seen certain things that Yakuza does, not only on level design, but in game design. There's some small stuff I want to talk about. Um, so if you come join me. I'm going to be over there in just a minute. I'm just going to get things set up. Please do so. Uh, if you are on Twitch, obviously ask the questions. But if you are a member of the Discord through the Patreon, you will get the priority questions for that. So the ones I'll answer first. Okay. Guys and girls, I'm going to be over in just one minute, so if you just give me uh, a few seconds, I'll be hopping over <coughs> to join you, and you can see my beautiful face on Twitch. All right, everyone, see you soon. Bye. If you love game and level design as much as we do, then why not consider supporting Level Design Lobby on Patreon? Patreon is a crowdfunding platform that allows people to directly fund the content and creators that they love. From as little as $1 per month, you can help support us in our mission to unite and teach people across the world about the wonderful and unique field of game and level design, and get some great reward perks in return, such as access to the Level Design Lobby Community Discord, bi-monthly webinars, Level Design Weekends, and much more. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash leveldesignlobby for more information and to pledge your support today. Finally, we'd just like to say a massive thank you to all our current backers. It's thanks to the generous support of people like you that we are able to grow and can continue to bring you awesome, new, and exciting content. So thank you. And now back to our regularly scheduled program. Cool, cool, cool. Sorry about that, everyone. <laughs> Is that better? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, cool, cool, cool. It needs to... Uh, Sorry about that, everyone. Need to get better at... Uh learning how to use this this gear so i apologize um I need to get better with that mic. there we go uh so yeah now that we're actually back um sorry again there's overlapping audio as well that is now gone um so yeah thank you for joining the uh the talk then for yakuza that was a very interesting one it's very different to other sort of uh i guess other um level design for cities in a very different way which is great to see and uh yeah let's let's talk about it let's talk about things we've got another like 20 20 30 minutes to just chat and i think it'd be really cool to chat with all of you so let's bring up some stuff here well that's just embarrassing for me let's get it up okay this one comes from we're gonna jump straight into questions so if you do have some please shoot them across whether it be twitch or on discord as I said, this is more of a celebration for the Discord as we reached goal four, which is amazing. And I really just want to celebrate you guys and everything that you've done. So thank you very much. Now let's go to Water Malone. One of the questions I have when you are taking... Uh, he's already asking this one. Uh, So, okay, Water Malone asks the question, as you saw in the stream there, that there's quite a lot of lighting, and he's very much saying that this isn't, the lighting's purpose is not to guide the player, but instead it's quite overloading, and he's asking how do you, I guess, how do you stop that? Um, thank you very much for the question, dude, as always. Uh, so let's talk about that. You've got to remember, this is, this is a tough one, right? Because they are replicating we're replicating it's not tokyo it's another city in japan in the 80s so they have to stick to reference from that and if you see any pictures of japan i have not had the fortune yet to travel to japan but you see that a lot all these glowing signs neon very bright so it's a tough one they're probably having they probably had a chat with their environment artists 
to discuss about certain things like the balance between that. Now, in certain areas, they're going to reduce the number of lights, but in the area we saw, they had an absolute ton of lights. And that's because it's, it's a fine line. And because that street we were on was very much kind of a corridor, very narrow, it's kind of pulling us and pushing us through. Because if you notice this, and you probably will, but this blew my mind, I only learned this about a year ago. Think about the shape of corridors, they're rectangles. And just stop and ask, why are corridors rectangles? It's because it's the way that they pull you through. Because they are just that kind of straight shape, it's just pulling you along with the wall. But if a corridor, for example, were like squares or circles, you wouldn't really know what to go, which is why rooms are actually more square. Because the point is to keep you in that room while a corridor is meant to pull you or push you in a direction. And what we saw there was the fact that they are much more, because they're corridors, they have more of that to pull and push you. I do think the balance is not quite, for me when I say this, was not quite bang on as tight as I would have liked it. But again, it's a tough line here. Like if, when working on division, one of the things that we had the hardest in was to have weenies and landmarks because all the buildings are like 20 stories tall, if not taller in New York. So you can't always get a clear lay of the land because there is, they are that tall and that high. So I hope that answers your question. It was a tough one for them. Generally though, a level designer should, after you know, level design build it out, artists will come prop it, line art will do a pass, and then later level design should come along and talk about this. Now, they like said you need to understand the purpose of that because that corridor may not have had a gameplay purpose so maybe it's actually all right to get away with that okay we're going to move on to the next questions that we have charles asks, seeing as the city architecture with the lighting and everything is quite overwhelming i feel the hood minimap is very relied upon what are your thoughts and possible critiques that they could have done to lean off that crutch yeah, I agree on that one. It was definitely much more, you definitely paid attention more to that. And again, though, remember guys, this is uh, this is very difficult to do with the fact that you're basing it on a real city. That's where things, if you look at stuff that are more made up cities, you can get away with a lot more of not needing to follow certain conventions. Because I believe you can probably Google, uh, I think it might be Kotaku, but they're, they're known for doing the stuff where it's, them comparing side by side the real uh, picture and the pictures in, in the game. So, and seeing how well they compare. So that's probably one of the things. One of the things I guess I would do would kind of lower certain buildings and raise others. Uh, but the other issue is if you look to the camera perspective, you know, if this is, this is us, the camera is very much here looking down. And so you have to make a lot of time to look up so I would have kind of lowered the buildings personally <clears throat> and start to have more kind of landmarks that you can see around. And also the city is very flat. It's not elevated in certain areas. It probably would have been nicer if like it's either on a slant or certain things are raised via platforms or something like that. That's what I would have recommended as well. So something I think you could have done to help raise that for sure uh, by having that. I think also <clears throat> they do it very well with the difference between the uh, the streets and the alleys where the population changes. I think having some sort of that, some more movement, because a lot of people, it's a city, so there's a lot more, it's more, more uh, sporadic in terms of movement. But if, however, they were to do it where there, you'd have more people moving in a certain flow, that way it guides the players and wonder, oh, what's going on down here? You could have done that to also help with certain things as well to, to push and pull with it. I don't think the mini, th mini map's bad with it. I think it's not, it's, you know, it's not bad to have a mini map, but yeah, there could have been a lot more. I find with that city as well, there's a lot more kind of these random encounters where thugs come up to you and it's not necessarily, the city is not trying to constantly have things come at you. It feels more alive in other cities because of the fact when you move something triggers like at the end of the stream where we had those people come up to a side quest i didn't know that was happening 
So it's nice little things like that. But I definitely think you're right and agree that there could be things just improve. So I've raised the area, lower and raise certain buildings. I'd probably try and reduce certain amount of lights and stuff or change where they are. Because if it's in a certain district, which is the pie district, which is what we saw, if you remember when I turned around and you had that kind of dance plaza, with the, uh, the triangular roof, I think that's kind of more party area. So having that where the lights were more leading closer, you know, the quarter closer to that <coughs> landmark. But if we're further back, it's much more dim. So you can kind of separate that with lighting as well. That's a few suggestions that I would have. Michelle, she uh, asked, building on the hood combo as an aspiring UI designer. Awesome. <coughs> Sorry, guys. Uh, how do you design the hood placement, color, etc., to make sure it doesn't take away from the level design or maybe add to the experience? This is a very tough one and it's really dependent on the game and the genre as well because uh, it's, it's a very interesting one. I think one of the things that we've kind of gone, um, I mean, as an industry as a whole, we're all kind of guilty for, is we're kind of putting basically placeholders on everything now. I think what needs to happen more is we need to pull back on, on that, like uh, markers unless the player has placed it or something, so that we can kind of trust and force level designers to make their environments much more uh, appealing, if you were. And that's also harder now in open world because we're still, as designers, I still think we are growing from open worlds. If it's a linear game, it's a lot easier to do because you know you start here and you're gonna finish here. But in an open world, it's kind of a lot more complicated for that. Um, hood placement. Yeah, that's a good one. A lot more people now, I think you'll notice with you being an aspiring UI designer, is that people are actually uh, having the hoods kind of fade out now, unless they interact with uh, the menu or something, or fast change weapons. The hood's kind of disappearing, so that way it feels less intrusive and a bit more immersive as well. Generally, it's normally put into the top left, bottom left, bottom right, top uh, top right corner. It's normally it's in a corner that the, the hood goes. But I think there's still you know a chance for things to to be changed and experimented with. And what I'd advise to you right now, because you know you're learning and growing, experiment with it, push those things. Like, try to figure out a way to do that. I think one of the best hoods to ever do it was, um, uh, two of them, was Dead Space. One of the best by far, because it felt like in there. Like, the health bar was built into the costume, as well as the holographic uh, when you went to your inventory and it wouldn't pause the game. So experiment with these things. There's some amazing stuff out there, and I recommend you to try experiment with the placement of it. And remember, UI is useful. I, you know, I believe it's a, a strong part of games. It just needs to be done right and kind of more integrated in a, a different way. Sorry, I can't give more of a uh, <laughs> an in-depth kind of answer for that one. UI is not my specialty, but I hope that kind of helps with that one there. But okay, we're going to move on to the next one. Uh, Yes, yeah, so uh, Andros Game Dev up on Twitch. What is going on, my man? Uh, I hope I said the name correctly. Uh, <laughs> says that I personally found these areas, especially the smaller alleys, lacked a certain amount of vertical vertical variation of level design. Of course, there are some signs and balconies, but it doesn't feel like they really reach over the streets and people could really actually stand on it. So it feels sometimes flat for me, especially in smaller areas. I agree. Like even when you went up and down the stairs when you saw at certain points, it didn't feel enough coming down it because it was just kind of the the time it took to walk down the stairs was about one one second at most so yes i agree that was one of the things we spoke about earlier that one of the things they could help to improve is again verticality now i like your ideas of the balconies and crossways but even just literally just raising certain areas by a meter or two meters maybe three etc not by much can make a place feel different you know what i mean like you just even coming down some grand staircase would be used as a mem uh, as a landmark and a, a memory point for players as well. So I think that stuff can be tweaked upon, and it'd be a very interesting one. Excuse me, to 
to see if they could have been, could have done that. But then again, when you're sticking to source material, it makes things harder. But there should definitely always, always be creative liberty taken, because remember, you're not building. Like, when I say walking sim simulator, I actually mean walking simulator, not the genre of games or anything. You're not building that for the players just to walk around the city, as immersive as that is. You're actually trying to make a game that is fun. But as you notice, like I said, it's offset the grid slightly in order to do things like that as well. Okay. Uh, oh, cheers, Charles. Diegetic was the specific term for... Um, why am I struggling now? For Dead Space. Thank you <laughs> for that one, buddy. Uh, okay. If you'd like to, I could dig up some more. Oh, awesome. Charles is going to help Michelle. Cheers, dude. I like how the community is coming together. Thank you very much for everyone being very nice to each other. Yeah, Water Malone is saying how much he likes the level, uh, the hood disappearing and the minimalism of the hood for Last of Us because it relies more on level design. Yes, uh, I agree, but that goes back to my point as well as it's a lot more of a control environment when you're making a linear game, so you can plan this a lot a lot better and pull things compared to an open world or a hub style kind of game like this or others because you, you need to kind of want the player to explore all but then also kind of pull them at the right time so it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing to do but yeah I mean look Naughty Dog is some of the best there is one of the best studios in my opinion I absolutely love what they do and their work it is yeah they are truly amazing Right, we got any other uh, other cool people's questions that they want to ask? Come on, hit me with your best shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> BM says, I really love games with minimal hoods. This is probably why I don't like MMORPGs. That's an interesting one. Uh, I think that, that's, that's a really different, like genre with different things i used to be a huge world of warcraft player i really enjoyed it uh there were some plugins where you could like minimize or even expand your hood so i, I understand what you're saying but give, do give them a try i absolutely love world of warcraft still uh okay uh andros game dev says uh, I didn't see enough of the game right now, but do you have any tips for good variation between large and small areas? A person like this in Batman Arkham Asylum. Yeah, uh, this is a really interesting one for it. This can be used for many different ways. This isn't just uh, just one answer solves everything or one solution for every single game when I say this. So it's up to you to kind of experiment with certain things as well. So with the, the variations, generally one of the reasons that you do this is to have a bigger impact on the reveal of a location, which is gonna be grander. So if you want it to feel bigger than it actually is as well, is you stick the plane in a very tight space. In a real life situation, for example, if you go to London, I mean, you think about London Underground, when you like go to leave, it's really tight place. A lot of the uh, corridors that you move through are really tight, packed. The ceiling's quite low as well. And then that is for when you come out. I mean, obviously it's there for structural reasons as well. But when you come out of it, when you leave to go into London on the city level, it feels even bigger. And so that's one of the reasons that we use the difference in the contrast of space is by doing this, it has a bigger impact and a larger effect on that feeling of reveal another reason we do this is it also kind of telegraphs to the player what to kind of expect if you're in a small area you're probably not going to get into combat as much it depends on the game obviously there's some things uh, sorry some games that do do this but having that signifies to the player on certain things of kind of what you know what they need to focus more on traversal here and large space normally used for combat because you're going to focus on flanking routes, different lengths of combat, you know, like such as sniper rifles or melee, these sort of things. Again, it's not for everything, but you can use those in certain different ways to highlight what kind of kind of foreshadow what kind of gameplay that you're going to have here. 
Um, sorry. Uh, one of the things is it doesn't always have to be the width of the uh, of the space, but it also can be the height of the ceiling because that can change things as well. Because that can still make a room feel really small in comparison to when you have a, a giant ceiling. That's a, a big one that I'd recommend there uh, for it. So I hope that answers it. There is more I can go into, but we're gonna keep answering more questions. I hope that's okay, dude. If not, just ask another one and we'll come back to the question, buddy. Okay, Snow says, Metro does this well and the stealth indicator and the filter time in uh, regard to watch on the MC's wrist. What's the biggest challenge when it comes to designing a real world area? Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges is for sure making sure that that you kind of stick to it but don't it's especially from a level design versus environment art standpoint because the environment art really and rightly so want to make sure that you know that you stick to it as much as possible because if you're making a game in somewhere you want it to look like somewhere you know like think about um Let's look at Division 2's new reveal trailer, for example. If you remember that, you start in this kind of, it looks like a lush jungle. And you're coming through and you're thinking like, where is this? This looks so different to, especially New York. And you come out and then you find out it's actually in a park in Washington. And they got away with tricking the player on that because of the fact that it's, it's still actually in Washington and that's the location in Washington but it's not actually, you know, it's not actually a jungle. It's just a, a park in there. So artists are going to really want to stick to that. But you as a, as a level designer, what you're going to want to do is do take some creative liberties. It's okay to add, for example, a lot of things that we do in uh, Division was we added scaffolding or we did change an area so it was raised more or angled slightly different because it increased the combat like situation it was better for what we were using it for so let me just move that a little bit closer there so that's what i'd say with it you know it's great it's one of the biggest challenges for sure is i'm gonna sneeze <coughs> oh sorry guys bless me uh, <laughs> yeah one of the biggest things for sure is that it's finding that balance that's one of the big ones because you can't change too much but do, do not be afraid to make those changes. Because that's what I say is keep the script, but not letting it block gameplay. Gameplay is key for you as a level designer, and it's generally key for games because it needs to be fun. That's, that's one of the most important things for me. Okay. Uh, Michelle asks, what did you think about God of War level design? No spoilers, but the lake area I thought was really interesting and how randomly you'd stumble uh, upon paths super tucked away. Uh, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It's some of the, the better level design I've seen in a while. I don't want to go too much because I'm actually going to do an episode on this. I was debating between uh, doing Yakuza or God of War, but because I'm doing an episode and hopefully we'll be having a, a guest uh, doing answering for who one of the level design who made uh, God of War, answering questions on it. So hopefully we'll be able to answer that. But I really love it. I think there's a lot of really nice stuff there. But again, compared to Yakuza, it's um, easy is not the word I want to say. It's it's a much more controlled environment, so allowing the players to kind of get an understanding more. So that's really cool. All right, Fall does a great job as well. <laughs> I'm trying not to give any spoilers about anything on God of War, my friend. Okay, speaking of open maps, some time ago I saw a really good article about the new uh, Zelda. Zelda, man, some of the best open world design, if not the best open world design ever, in my opinion, hands down. It is absolutely bad ass. It blew me away, and I'm hoping the article talks about the triangle theory it uses in there. For those of you who don't know, if you look at a lot of things that they do, it's very much based in triangles to lead to a certain point. And what they also do is they block and occlude certain areas. So it encourages players to go to higher vantage points. So then the player gets a bigger lay of the land. 
and they have a great opportunity with Hyrule because it's not based on anything. It's not a city. It's not a real place. So they have all these landmarks everywhere. You have the big global ones, which you can see from all around, such as the uh, Hyrule Castle. You can always see that because that's your main goal and that's in the center. You can always, always see that. And they have these sort of smaller landmarks, such as like cave shaped skulls or giant mountains. Maybe see a dragon flying. So there's all these other things. It is the best open world design by far, in, in my opinion. I absolutely adored it. Uh, do we have any more last questions before I uh, bring this lovely recording to an end? Uh, I'm going to just quickly say a few words before we uh, do bring it to an end. Uh, if, unless anyone's got a question, please ask it now. I just say thank you all very, very much for, for everything. Honestly, you were, you're all amazing. Like the fact that you are supporting this and you are, you know, your kind words and everything, it really helps me um, to, to do this and keep going because I'm human. There's some days when I'm tired uh, and that's why I've not always been responsive because of certain things happening. And, oh, Alex says thank you as well. If you don't know, Alex is the associate producer. He has been an amazing help to you all. And it's because of you, we've been able to get Alex to help make all, well, to help improve improve this. So again, we both just want to say thank you so much for everything, because you guys have helped bring the level design lobby to a new level, allowing us to do such things as Twitch, we've got new sound uh, for the opening, we've got animations for the YouTube, and much more we've got all of this and we just want to say thank you honestly so if you are not a patreon though do come check us out on patreon which is just level design lobby we can get some amazing cool perks join our community of amazing people on the discord so uh oh we've got one more question before i close it off uh andros game dev says i actually work on a game prototype with a zelda based dungeon design i'm really struggling a bit with backtracking ways a suggestion to work around them well, what's the problem with the backtracking? What is it? Are you not wanting the player to backtrack or is it you do want it and it just doesn't feel right? Backtracking is a really tough one. I think loads of different level designers have different opinions and philosophies on uh, backtracking. The biggest tip I have for backtracking is, is this. If you're going to come back on the same area, um, do I have pen and paper somewhere? Do I have a pen? Cool. All right. All righty. You're going to have to forgive me because this is quite a on the spot thing for drawing a bit of an answer. Oh. Okay, so backtracking. Now, I actually don't mind backtracking. I think if it can be done in a really good way. You just have to make sure that it doesn't feel the same when you're coming back. Arkham Asylum is one of the best because you do constantly explore, and same with City, the same areas over and over. But what do they do that makes it amazing is this. is It works with their story because every villain gets screen time, right? So what they're doing is they have, uh, say for example, it's a, car uh, it's a corridor. Uh, beginning, it's clean. It's very much because you're there. Now, Poison, I Poison Ivy is now the, the main boss in the section. Now, when we come back to this corridor, it's changed because there is all this, all this foliage around and that has some sort of mini gameplay in there, which is brilliant. So that's now changed the feeling of that one corridor. Not only looks, but feeling because of gameplay. So you need to make sure that it changes either because of the consequences in the story or because of what the player has done. And we come back to that corridor later again, we see that it is now graffitied with the Joker's uh, tags and now we see some enemies. So again, that feeling has changed and now the space is used for combat, not for a puzzle and not just through for traversal. So those are some ways that you can really do to help with backtracking. Another thing that I like to do personally, so say if we, this is going to be some really crude drawing, so I apologize everyone. Okay. Uh, uh, so we've got this room here and we've come up through, uh, through here. 
Now we come in here and then we eventually leave the room and we're going to come back. So what, when we come through here, we come on the ground floor. But now when we come back, what you want to do is just like So when we come, I hope this is a, it's a really crude drawing. What we'll find is, is this. We come in here and this is say we're on the ground floor. We've got a landmark in the center as well as these pillars as well so that the player can do this. But these pillars are also restricting the player's view as could the landmark. It could be tall, it's up to you. So this way the player it doesn't always reveal everything but they've got a sense of the area. They kind of know it. It's like 80% you know, C. But when we leave and we come back up on here, I'm glad everyone's losing their mind from my poor drawing. Um, say we come back on this side here. Now we come back on the raised level, so we're on the first floor. And if you look as well, because these pillars are actually kind of blocking, well not blocking, but obscuring the view of your original entrance, so the player has to come closer to get that reveal, it makes the space feel different. And because the landmark isn't something circular, it's you know got a bit of difference on it, they're seeing it in a different light, which again makes that space feel different. So play around with when you come back that you kind of restrict the view. And I don't mean by a lot. I'm just talking just by a little bit. That's about 20% or something, if not less. So you can do that for it. And then coming at a higher perspective as well, looking down can change that feeling as well. You coming up on a higher or a lower floor will change the whole feeling of the room as well. So there's some other tips on backtracking. Uh, generally one of the things you can also do with backtracking is just make it a shortcut back to the entrance if you don't want anything to happen there but again it's really dependent on your game mate so I hope that has helped with it um, it's not good LD <laughs> sorry I'm out of napkins my man Jack O knife uh, okay I think that's where we will wrap it all up so thank you very much everyone Oh, yeah, Dark Souls and um, uh, Bloodborne have some really nice things, and that's really well like looped around. Especially with it's more about the the shortcuts. That's really well done. So good spot on that one. Good spot. Um, no worries, man. Please do join if you are. I think most people here are already part of the Patreon, but if you're not, come and join us. We've got some amazing people who are doing some amazing things, and we just chat about all this stuff and we help each other out. So again, from me and Alex, thank you very much, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure, and I hope you have enjoyed this kind of like hour-long uh, session when we do a game and we do Q and A after. Well, I guess we'll maybe think about doing more. We'll try to figure that out. If that's what you want, let us know if that is something that you'd like to do uh, later. Just again, thank you all very much. I will see you all later. Have a great weekend and do enjoy yourselves. Either play some games or get out and and just enjoy yourselves, guys. Uh, oh, actually, one last thing. No, I'll save that for a Q and A. So <laughs> it's easier to break it down. Uh, but yeah, thank you all very much. Take it easy, everyone, and I'll catch you all next time. Bye. Stop the streaming.